so let's start um, slowly and easily. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining shortly after school or while you're still at school. Um, uh, my name is Yolan. I work in the collections engagement team at Europeana. I will be your guide through Europeana, what APIs are, how you can use APIs for education for the two webinars of today and tomorrow. Um, so we'll be talking from the very bottom up for people that don't know what Europeana is at all yet. Uh, we'll explain what Europeana is, what APIs are about, what Europeana's APIs are about, and then there will be time for us to discuss together how this can um, influence your projects, how um, using digital cultural heritage can be used within um, your education projects. So tomorrow we'll mostly be hearing from you. Today will be more of a lecture style thing. Um, and I will also introduce Isabel Crespo, who some of you might know or might have mailed with. Um, for others who don't know her, she is our uh, extraordinary education uh, manager, I can say, or coordinator um, at the collections engagement team, something like that. Everything with education is uh, Isabel's work. So uh, Isabel will start off with, I think, a bit of general information about the low code fest in general, so you know exactly what to expect. Um, and then we will continue with the capacity building. So Isabel, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Yolan. Uh, let me share the screen and here it is. So welcome again, everyone. Uh, let me move here. Okay, that's honestly, then I don't have uh, all the envelopes uh, open. So, um, um, my name is Isabel Crespo, and uh, it's a bit uh, unknown and still the, the name because I have different names uh, and uh, officially still is not published, but I'm the education specialist and education and a community manager. So before um, kicking off the, the capacity building phase that is going to be run by, by Jolan uh, today and tomorrow, I wanted to introduce you a little bit the work uh, in uh, in education uh, that the European Foundation is is um, is uh, doing. Um, in a nutshell, because we have several lines of work and we work with several projects and partners, uh, what we try to do is to mainstream the use of uh, digital cultural heritage, the content of the Europeana.eu platform that uh, uh, Yolan will introduce in a, in a second, but also the resources uh, uh, and uh, services products we develop with partners. Uh, Europeana.eu is a um, endless source of knowledge. We are constantly ingesting materials, improving uh, the metadata, the functionality. So this is something that we aim to bring to every student, every educator, every school in Europe. So to make that happen, um, we have to work, work with partners, as you can imagine, we work with the ministries of education, um, but also with uh, European associations and networks that they work in, uh, in uh, experts in pedagogies, uh, but also with the industry, with software developers, with entrepreneurs, that uh, startups, that they are uh, using our materials, uh, some, of, uh, some of them uh, using APIs uh, to create new learning uh, products. What we do in education is uh, pretty much aligned with the Digital Education uh, Action Plan of the European Commission. Um, we strongly believe that digital education content and training is going to be essential for staff. There's no uh, much discussion about it. And we also believe that uh, a trusted education ecosystem will require high quality content. And here we can play uh, a key role, Europeana. User-friendly tool, these are the things that we are trying to develop with all these partners, but also learner-centered design. And uh, here is where uh, all the teachers, the Europeana educa Educators Ambassadors are playing also an important role to help us to implement this content with innovative uh, pedagogies uh, and, and technologies. But the Europeana initiative is very complex. We won't have the time today to, to, to give you a complete picture, but uh, Europeana has many different entities, different bodies. Uh, there's the Europeana Foundation, where uh, Yolan and I uh, are the staff members and the core services all around the Europeana.eu platform. But there's uh, also the Europeana Network Association. This is um, that puts together professionals from many different domains. Uh, 
mainly from cultural heritage, from the cultural heritage sector, but also educators and researchers that uh, believe in the power of uh, digital technologies and uh, cultural heritage to transform the world. So they are aiming also for raise awareness about opening uh, collections and democratize the access to culture. This, we have around 3,000 uh, members. Uh, I know that some of you are already uh, ENA, uh, ENA members. Um, but uh, those professionals are organizing uh, what we call uh, special interest groups of communities uh, for many different um, areas of interest and domains like communication, impact, uh, research, but of course also for uh, education. Um, it's free to join. This is something that um, it has uh, a lot of uh, benefits because you can engage with uh, like-minded people, participate or be aware of uh, relevant um, European projects. Uh, but also you can have a say, you can uh, be part of the members, you can become a members council, the selections every year, and um, uh, yeah, uh, put your voice uh, on uh, European uh, matters. Uh, every community is, is, uh, has a steering group uh, with few members. Um, the ones you see here are Alteo, who is the chair. Tomorrow will be with us um, to introduce himself and uh, tell us a bit more of next steps when we finalize the capacity building phase we are in now. Uh, Loa and Margarita, they are the co-chairs of our community, myself as a community manager, but also Ping, Marco and, and Ilona. And we are right now uh, recruiting new members. Uh, we are closing the, the call, but if you still are, if you are a member and still interested, so please uh, send us uh, your CV and your motivation data. Um, the things we do in our um, in European Foundation, the staff members, and the things we do with the, com with the community are a bit different, um, but um, again, very uh, brief uh, in a nutshell. Uh, the overarching goal of our community is to strengthen the collaboration between formal and non-formal educators, um, but at the same time also building connecting different educational um, audiences um, to create this uh, educational ecosystem. So we started very um, closely working with teachers uh, in primary and secondary. But uh, and organizing a group of ambassadors, but uh, also in time we wanted to involve all the CHI professionals uh, working in education because of course uh, there's a lot of uh, um, learning in non-formal settings that we need to to uh, to highlight and, and to put in in value. And uh, ultimately, we are also trying to work uh, or involve more closely uh, students in our activities. One good example is a uh, with bits, and uh, some of you have been also very much um, uh, involved uh, uh, when we started this project. Uh, uh, the first edition happened in 2021, and uh, our um, this is a training um, program for teachers and educators. So we started mostly for teachers uh, in 2021 but also an educational challenge for the students with the idea of helping them to create an immersive space on Mozilla Hubs. This is the, the technology we, we chose, uh, um, but based in the values of the new European Bauhaus. Sustainable, um, beautiful, together, inclusive. And we had a very um, impressive results. Uh, we engage uh, with more than 20 teachers and more than 500 uh, students. And you can see a sneak peek of, uh, of the rooms they created uh, from scratch that uh, were quite, quite impressive. Um, we wanted to follow up and we are running right now uh, the Build With Bits 2. Uh, and uh, again, with the idea of connecting different uh, educational uh, stakeholders. So we've uh, um, count, uh, counted with the collaboration of CHI institutions like the House of European History. And, um, and also students, we, we will work with educators, teachers that they proposed uh, uh, new ideas, but also with uh, students and creatives that will help us to, to develop uh, the ideas of, of, the, of the educators. This uh, started in June and we will fin finalize uh, all the projects by the end of um, 2022. So stay tuned uh, to, the, to see the results. Um, all these things that we are doing uh, are 
having kind of an impact, a positive impact in the um, in the use of uh, or increased reuse of uh, digital cultural heritage in education, and we see a correlation um, with the amount of uh, students uh, that are most engaged uh, in our uh, platform at European Adotio with the work we are we are doing. So this is something that we have to um, to greet, congratulate uh, uh, to the community for for this fantastic job, and. Um, this is all from me. Uh, I will hand over to Yolan. Uh, if you have any question, please uh, put it in the chat. I'll be happy to answer, but I'll be with you learning about APIs uh, uh, in the coming uh, minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Isa. Uh, great presentation. Um, from here on out, I think Isa, you, you had a very, you gave a very good overview of what Europeana is doing in education specifically. Um, for the rest of the session today, um, what I mostly will be focusing on is uh, from a very basic perspective, people that haven't heard of Europeana or you have only very uh, recently heard of Europeana, you haven't worked with Europeana that 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 much, uh, I will give a bit of an overview of who we are and what we do. So to some of you, this might be a bit of repetition. Uh, my apologies for that, but it's just so that we're all on the same level. Um, and the second part of this session, I will talk also broadly on what an API exactly is, um, and, and what Europeana's APIs do. Tomorrow, we will continue to go more in depth ab uh, about what tools you can use to leverage those APIs, what projects you can build on APIs, not only those of Europeana, but other cultural heritage APIs as well. Um, so that's what you can expect. Uh, I will share my screen. And um, same for me, if you have any questions uh, during my presentation, uh, feel free to put them in chat. I will uh, keep an eye on it and answer them. Uh, when I can. So uh, I already told about what we're going to cover. Intro to Europeana, intro to digital cultural heritage data and metadata. What's an API and what are Europeana's APIs? That's what we're going to do today. First off, Europeana. Um, a bunch of you have already heard of it. Um, if you're unsure, we are a European Commission led or found, uh, founded initiative. So we get um, funding from the European Commission since 2008 every year to be the main platform where all digital cultural heritage in Europe is uh, uh, made accessible, made visible, made reusable. So uh, we focus on Europe for its cultural heritage, um, but also because we are uh, connected to the European Commission very closely. We've been doing this so since 2008 for quite a while, um, which means that currently our platform, our database, has over 50 million items um, from across all of Europe's um, cultural heritage um, organizations. Uh, these are galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. Uh, we use the abbreviation GLAM to kind of talk about all of these together. So if you hear me saying GLAM in the future, that means galleries, libraries, archives, museums. Um, and uh, what we do is take that digitized cultural heritage in and give access to it online for everyone to use. Um, of those more than 50 million items, almost half, 47%, is completely free to reuse in education, in research. Um, you can print it on a tote bag and sell it in your Etsy shop. You can use it in a built with bits thing. You can make a GIF of it. Whatever you want to do with these objects, you are free to do. No conditions apply. So that means that they are either in the public domain or they have the CC0 license. Um, we find licensing and copyright very important to make sure that Every person that goes to Europeana and goes to an object knows exactly what they can and cannot do with that object. That's also important when you're using our APIs or creating a project for cultural heritage that you know to select the items that um, you know you can use without an issue on your own platform. Um, so we have very easy filters for that on the API side, or if you're browsing Europeana, every object will have its own copyright license that says, um, yes, you can use this no, you cannot use this, uh, or here are the conditions for using that. So almost half you can use without an issue. If you expand this definition to some kind of reuse, so these are all of the Creative Commons licenses, CC BY, CC BY SA, and so on and so forth, um, you come to about three quarters of our whole collection. So about 72% of our collection you can use with some restrictions, um, especially in education, the 72% is important since there's 
often a bit more leniency towards using cultural heritage for education than if you would use it, for instance, commercially. Um, so that means that a huge chunk of, the, of, of the, that database of those 50 million items, millions and millions of those items you can use for your um, application, for your project, for your program, in your classroom, um, which also means that probably on every topic you can think of, there will be something that you can find in your piano. There's, of course, topics that you'll find more about and topics you'll find less about, or the data might not be as good or in another language. Um, but anything you can think of, it's worth looking up in your piano and seeing if you can find data for it um, that you can reuse. What do we use that uh, that data for at your piano? Um, one of the things we do is we create editorial, um, which is uh, which means that we uh, create blogs and digital exhibitions and galleries to inspire people to learn about the history and the stories of uh, of Europe's cultural heritage, of, of Europe's past. Um, we find this really important because there are so many um, interesting, valuable, hidden stories within this huge mountain of data. And when you go to Europeana, it's it's easy to get lost in all of this data, not knowing where to start, not knowing what is interesting. So um, finding inspiration through these stories, reading a few of our blogs, going to an exhibition can be a really good starting point to see what is actually on offer uh, in, in the Europeana database on the Europeana platform. Um, and it might inspire you to create your own project. It might inspire your students to learn more about a subject they didn't know they were interested in. We do a bunch of other things with our data uh, that isn't editorial. Um, one thing that we do every year that is going on right now is our yearly Gift It Up competition, where we uh, it, where we engage people to create gifts using cultural heritage. Um, this is a collaboration between us, the Digital Public Library of America, Trove in Australia, and uh, the Giphy platform, which you might know from all of the GIFs you use in WhatsApp or Signal or on, uh, in Messenger. Wherever you use GIFs, you're probably using Giphy. Um, this yearly competition uh, is a really good way, especially for students, younger people, to engage with cultural heritage because it becomes very tangible for them. If they create a GIF and it is shown on Giphy, they can use it and send it to all of their friends. These GIFs that we create gets used millions of times. So it's a really great way to um, expand the reach of digital cultural heritage um, to you know people's phone screens that, that, that they are in anyway all the time, um, every day. Another thing that, that we were kind of um, closed in over the past few years was uh, working at home during the pandemic. So another thing we did now is maybe a, a little less relevant, but we made a lot of Zoom backgrounds using cultural heritage, um, using good artworks um, to kind of brighten up your, your Zoom meetings. And that's, the, that's the, the screenshot you see on the right, which can still be a nice initiative if you're, for instance, um, still teaching remotely. More relevant for our uh, topic today, which is APIs, is that your Piana is an open data platform. All of the things that you see on europeana.eu, everything that is built there was built using our APIs and everything that we have created in the background, all that backend is completely open to reuse for anyone else. So basically any competitor could come in tomorrow build your piano exactly the way that we did it because they have access to all the same tools that we have um, you know make a carbon copy of it and maybe be more successful at it as we do but we think it's really important to have all of the tools that we have created openly freely available no paywalls no you know registering with your facebook account or whatever um, you can access all of those tools and create any cool integration or data platform or app that you want to create using your piano's data um, one example I always like to go to is this, which is called the Color Explorer, which is a very easy, simple piece of code that someone made where it randomly chooses a color um, and then it uh, queries your Piano's database for all objects using that color um, mostly. So then you get this really cool gallery that has never been created before of objects that share a color. So now this bisque color is maybe a bit unclear i like more vivid colors so i'm going to reload this website and see which color is used cadet blue and then you see mostly blue images um, which is a really nice way of creating a gallery out of thin air 
and putting images next to each other that have never been seen next to each other before. This uh, kind of, uh, I think it's a, di a, a projector of some kind, um, is probably from a completely different country, a completely different institution, curated by someone in a that speaks a different language than this this picture of leaves or this uh, nostalgia image. Um, and suddenly, in a kind of transnational way, uh, you know, pan-European way, they are put next to each other in one gallery um, using just a little bit of code. So that, to me, shows the really nice kind of um, integrations that can be done with Europeana's APIs. Um, with of, of course some coding was necessary for it and i'm aware that this is a low code fest but this is a, a a good example of the things you can do with a little bit of innovation um other examples that other people have made um is here in the the bottom right corner if you uh, use uh, google slides which is the google version of of a uh, uh, PowerPoint, uh, there is a little extension that you can install where you can search on your Piana from within your Google Slides website. And so whenever you want to use images in a slideshow, you can search your Piana really quickly and just drag and drop some images into that Google Slides. And that integration is possible because our platform and our APIs are completely free to use um, and anyone can build something on top of it. Uh, so, so I use that almost every day to to build slideshows like like this one, and uh, it goes really well. Um, I, I won't um, talk too much about this slide because I think Isabel talked about the our network um, uh, very uh, well. Um, one thing that is important to know, especially when you're looking at what our data looks like, is that we work with more than three thousand five hundred cultural heritage institutions throughout all of Europe. Even though Europeana is a big in, big organization, it's impossible for us to work personally with every one of these institutions. So we have a kind of middle layer called the aggregation layer, where there are other organizations called aggregators that work directly with these institutions. They aggregate, that's why they're called aggregators, that data into their database, make everything homogeneous into the Europeana data model which we'll talk about a bit later, and then send that to us. And this middle layer is really important to make sure that we can take all of this data on and not be uh, bogged down with, with personal relationships and personal, personal work with thousands of, of museums. Um, this is important to know because it is reflected in the data as well. There are several layers within every um, object on Europeana where you'll be able to trace back, oh, this was a piece of metadata that an aggregator added, or this is a piece of metadata that a data provider, um, and with a data provider, we mean the original institution, so the original gallery or museum or library that they have added, or maybe there's some metadata that we, Europeana, have added. So knowing this provenance of the different pieces of metadata in a data object is really important when you're going to try and use that data for your own purposes. It's also a really good thing to show uh, students and people that are learning about IT, how the internet works, how APIs work, how data gets built on and gets added to when it goes through these different uh, stages. Um, a, 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 an object on a website, a piece of metadata is, is a living kind of creature that maybe starts in a museum on a shelf somewhere and a curator adds some metadata, but then it goes to an aggregator and they add some information and then it goes to us and we add some information. Um, and being able to think critically about who has added some data where is uh, is really crucial. So that's why I'm why I'm talking about this. Um, yes, aggregators can be either um, thematic aggregators or domain aggregators. These are aggregators that um, talk about a specific topic or want to um, take in data around one theme. So this can be the fashion uh, um, topic. We have the European Fashion Heritage Association that deals with all data that is fashion related. Um, or we can have regional or country aggregators that want to take in all of the data from institutions of a single country or a single region. Um, an example... Uh, there are examples. I can't immediately think of one. Well, in, in the Netherlands, there's the Netwerk Digital Erfut or DEN, um, which uh, are kind of responsible for all of the Dutch cultural heritage institutions. Um, so data providers versus aggregators, important thing to remember. Then of course we have our network association. Please become a part of it as Isabel already said, we're a lovely group of people and there's a lot of perks to be had um, by becoming part of our network. 
just as we're doing now, Europeana also does a lot of work to support the sector at large, not only um, uh, be a kind of store for data, we also want to lead the way in uh, development of cultural heritage knowledge and do capacity building on how cultural heritage institutions can uh, further their own digital transformation. We do all of that on a separate platform called pro.europeana.eu, which I'm sure you know about because the Low Code Fest was uh, a page on that website. Um, the two most important uh, links um, there, maybe research is less important here, but um, the APIs page is your starting point for whenever you want to create an integration, start a data project, or teach your students about how to use cultural heritage data. So um, I'm going to surf through it really quickly with you all. This is our APIs landing page. Um, this is the hub where you'll find all of the information you need on your Piana's APIs, from documentation to how to get an API key, to um, integrations that other people have made, to FAQs, tutorials, things like that. Those are all um, available here. The first thing you'll want to do, um, if you haven't done it yet, is go here, get the API key. This is the only barrier we have in the way to using our data, as I said, free without any walls. I lied, there's one small wall, it's getting an API key. Once you have that, you can have access to all of our data. Um, if you're a student, you can sign up to get an API key as well. It's yours to use um, as much as you want. It's as simple as filling in a small form. Um, you'll request a key and you'll automatically get a key back into your mailbox. And once you have that, you'll be able to um, make all of the calls and the examples that I am going to give today. Um, do it for yourself and kind of start exploring what cultural heritage data and digital data is all about. So talking about that data, let me see how late it is. Okay, great. Um, we're having a break at, at 5.15. So hang on for 15 more minutes and then you'll be able to have a break. I think that's right. Yes, Isabel? Okay, yes, good. Um, so I've talked a lot about Europeana as an organization, um, mostly with the goal of um, putting things in your head that you need to know when you're actually looking at a metadata file, you need to know what an aggregator is, what a data provider is, how your Piana is structured, structured. But let's dig a bit deeper into what our data actually looks like under the hood. All of your Piana's data is structured um, under something called the Europeana data model, which is one metadata model that organizes all of the information on your Piana. Every cultural heritage institution probably has their own specific data model as well. Your local gallery or museum or library has their data structured in some way that is working for them, good for them, and um, it makes things nice and orderly in their database. Taking all of those different pieces of data and just mashing them together in one database is completely unworkable. So we needed to create an interoperable model where all of this data could be stored, um, could be changed and stored in one model so that if you are searching for a title of something, they we always know where the title field is. If you want to search for a person or a creator, we will always know what the creator field of a metadata um, model is. So what the Europeana data model does in simpler terms is it turns physical objects um, or also digital objects, it turns cultural heritage into a web of information. Um, this is really important, even though it's a bit technical, but the Europeana data model works um, using a triple store, using the RDF model. Um, you don't need to know a lot about how RDF or how triples work, only that everything in a triple store is organized in sets of three. So you might be used to uh, a, a CSV file or a spreadsheet, or maybe even a, a relational database where everything is stored in tables, something is in a row and in a column. That's not how we store information on Europeana. We store things in a kind of web of knowledge. And um, this web is uh, organized, as I said, in threes. Those threes are always a subject, a predicate, and an object. Um, I should put, this on, put that on the slide, but um, I'll put that in chat so that we can remember this. Subject, predicate, object, which means that every subject, and I'm going to give the example here of um, the provided CHO, and CHO stands for Cultural Heritage Object, 
has a predicate. A predicate links two pieces of information together. So this cultural heritage object has a creator, and the creator is the predicate here, and the creator is the object Cristofori. So you see that this relationship happens um, in three pieces, the subject, provided cultural heritage object, the predicate, DC creator, and the object, Cristofori. This triple, as we'll call it, because it's three pieces of information, makes it possible to link different pieces of, of information together in a kind of chain. And if you create more of these chains, you'll create a web of information. So you'll see that um, the SCOS concept is a subject as well. Um, this subject has a URI, which is a piece of, of linked open data that we as humans cannot read. I don't know what MimoDB.eu2251 means, but luckily this subject has a predicate, um, or it has multiple predicates, but one of them is the uh, pref label, meaning here is the preferred label, and a label is always something that makes it readable for humans, because humans read labels, um, and the object is harpsichord in English. So here's the human readable um, information of the non-human readable information SCOS concept. So this again is this triple, but you'll see that that triple is connected to another triple, the provided cultural heritage object through DC type, the predicate. Um, right, technical ramble, it's not important to, to you know remember all of this, but knowing that everything is stored in trees, in threes, um, not in trees, in threes, and that this creates a web of knowledge um, is important uh, just so you don't um, have in mind that all of our data is stored in in a kind of um, a spreadsheet or a table because if you if you try to to not keep that in mind then the data might be very uh, confusing to you so good triples is the thing to remember um one thing i touched on in the in the last piece when i was rambling about triples is that there's linked open data in there there was this url that we didn't know what it meant but there was a, a, a label to it that meant, okay, this is a harpsichord. Linked open data is um, very important to make things easily searchable and findable on your piano. We get um, objects in from very uh, different sources, so from very different countries, meaning that, for instance, all this data comes to us in, in different languages as well. Um, the harpsichord that you saw in the last slide, I think it was originally a Dutch or a French um, object, but if you would search for the English word harpsichord in Europeana, you would still find that object. You'll find that object because we have added a linked open data URI, which is the machine readable version of harpsichord to that metadata. And if we do that, then that makes it possible for us to grab all of the translations from that uh, linked open data URI into our database to make it multilingually searchable and findable. So that is the main upside of using linked open data in our in our metadata. Um, everything that I talked about so far is important to know because you will see all of this in the metadata itself. If we're going to look at a metadata object, this object will be separated in different layers. It will be separated in layers that are the data object itself. So this file that is in a database somewhere. The physical object, the harpsichord we just saw, is a provided cultural heritage object. Then there's the different representations of that object. We might have made four or five pictures of that harpsichord, and each one of those pictures is a digital representation. And then there might be contextual information about this object, which means that that is information that isn't visible on the object itself, but is important, like the creator, for instance. The creator might not have signed his name on the harpsichord, but we know what the name is of that creator, so that is a contextual piece of information. Right, to kind of show um, what this looks like, we'll go to one of my favorite objects on Europeana, which is single ripe banana, um, which has an image. Right, some people might ask, is this cultural heritage? We say, yes, it is. This banana itself has a metadata record. Everything you'll see on this page, an image, a piece of copyright information, this banana is CC by SA, a title, single ripe banana, a description. In Ireland, bananas are one of the largest contributors towards reaching the recommended target of five servings of fruit or vegetables a day. And more other contextual information. 
the subject, the type of object. This is a photograph. If you go to all metadata, you'll see even more information. Where does this come from? The local government management agency. What is its provider? European food and drink, and so forth. It comes from the country Ireland. All of these pieces of metadata um, are very nicely presented here, but their origin is this. It has no API key provided because I haven't done so. I will do so now. So once you have an API key, you can do everything that I do as well. This is the metadata file behind that banana object. It's a bunch of information that is really hard to parse um, as a human, um, unless you go really into detail here, which we'll do a little bit. Um, and all of this information is then presented nicely on a website like Europeana. When you're going to work with APIs or when you're going to let your students work with APIs, they'll have to be able to see a file like this and not be scared by it, first of all, and just try and parse this information very slowly and easily, bit by bit, so that you can take that information and show it in a, in a different way on your own platform, in your own app, on your own website. So um, we're going to kind of dissect this a little bit before we go to break so that you can clear your mind after we've done this. The first thing here is some basic website stuff that is not important to know. It is saying which API key was used, the demo key, because I'm giving a demonstration now. Was this API call a success? True, yes, it was a success. Um, these are some stats on how long it took for the API to return our call, 187 milliseconds, and it's request number 999. Okay. This we can disregard. It's important for um, uh, database administrators and stuff. What is interesting for us is everything that is in this object. So what you'll see here, <laughs> uh, it's fine to be afraid. Uh, what you'll see here is um, that this isn't structured in a spreadsheet. It's structured in a hierarchical way. So this is a JSON file that structures everything um, under each other in a hierarchy, um, which means that this object contains a bunch of information. We can um, collapse all of this information clicking this, and then we'll see that there's one object here, um, which is that banana, and then all of that API information. So everything about that, 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 that banana is in this object field. It's stored under that. If we click it open again, we'll find all of this information. I'm just going to close all of these other little hierarchies first so that we can see what the structure is from a high level. We have the object and then there's one level down a bunch of other kind of headings or titles if you if you want to see it that way. We have aggregations, concepts, the data set name, all of the things you see here is the Europeana data model trying to structure information logically. So contextual information for instance information that isn't stored on this banana, but might be the creator who, who did it, when was it made, will be found in concepts. The concept we see here is that it is a photograph, which is the, the concept of, of, of what this image was. Um, we have described this concept photograph with a piece of linked open data. So this is a URL that you can surf to. So if we click on it, it will open in a new tab and it will show you the entity or the um, linked open data URL for photographs. So it links you to all of the other photographs. And this is another thing where linked open data is so in interesting. You might not want to search for banana, but if you want to search for all of the photographs, that banana will still be there because it's a photograph. Um, right, so we have this linked open data URL. As you see, this again is a triple, the same way that we saw in the in the picture before that. It has a concept, which is a subject. We want to know something about that concept, which is the predicate. And then the object itself is this URI. This is connected to another triple. This concept has a label, which we can read in different languages. Um, I mostly read English and Dutch, so I'm going to go to here in English. Oh yeah, right, okay, it's a photograph. Um, people that speak different languages will understand this as well. So um, in Italian, it's a photo. Um, this shows you everything under the concepts file. I won't go through every subheading here, but this is exactly how you should start to 
explore, um, kind of dissect a metadata file. Go from the very top of the hierarchy down one level every time, try to understand where this is coming from, and also reference back to where it is where it is shown. So this concept of photograph, we can actually go back to this image and or do, to this um, website and try to find where it is shown here. So here as well, we see that the type of object is a photograph. It actually has a link, which is the same link that we saw in the metadata file, and it will send you to the same photography um, URL. So um, throughout kind of the, the low code fest itself, we can analyze the other different things that you can find in a metadata file together. You might have a certain um, kind of idea in your mind of, I actually want to get this information from all of these metadata records and I want to show that in, the, in this way. Where should I find that information? That's something that we can figure out together. Um, but so there's no need to kind of know what a whole metadata file looks like. Find the things that you're interested in, in and work on those. So um, that was, it's 11 past, we're gonna stop here so you can digest this. Um, information about linked open data, um, I will do that after the break. Great, I see a bunch of things in chat. I know that yes, it's being recorded, so uh, you'll be able to listen to this again afterwards. Uh, positive feedback, thank you. Uh, I was just trying to mitigate a bit their their uh, their fear um, uh, on uh, yeah they, they will get the recording but also we will provide you with a virtual space where you can meet with your team members and ask us questions. Yolanda Maso will be there to support you with any, any technical um, question you you may have in the coming days. Uh, but I don't know, Yolanda, do you want to ask uh, to answer questions now or better at the end? Uh, if there's any questions now, I'd be happy to answer them before we uh, take a few minutes to ourselves. Any questions, feel free to just unmute and ask them or put them in chat. Silence well, is good. Not... <laughs> <laughs> let's have a break. And yes, see that means too. everything was clear. Uh, we'll see you all in 15 minutes. So let's say um, it's 13 past now. So at, at about 5.30. See you then.
Right. We'll be starting again in about a minute, I think. Okay. I think we're all back. I'll just start. If you're coming back while I'm talking, that's fine. Uh, great. For the last hour, let's go a little bit into um, some more detail about that metadata that we talked about uh, before. I showed you this uh, metadata JSON file, uh, which was a bit scary to look at. It had a bunch of different uh, fields and a bunch of different links to other websites as well. Important to know when you're looking at metadata files like these is that the actual content that it refers to might be stored in different places. Your Piana itself stores um, in our specific database. Basically, all we store are those metadata files, are those those JSON files, those basically files of text that refer to other things. Um, this is what I mean with that we store descriptive and te technical metadata. Those JSON files are uh, stored within a database with us and all of the information that comes with that, so title, creator, subject, rights, are all found in those files. Another thing we store is thumbnails. So if you would go to, oops, let's go back. If you would go to um, your Piana and type in any search term, all of the images you see here are of course, smaller images and the original image. They are thumbnails of the actual image. These are stored on our servers as well. So if you uh, make requests to our API, you're able to um, get all of these thumbnails um, from our servers too. Other things we store that are not um, metadata that has been created by the Cultural Heritage Institution is other metadata that was generated by users. Um, so this can be uh, people that have transcribed a piece of a manuscript into text. This can be a semantic annotation that someone has put through a crowdsourcing tool and so has provided more tags to us. Um, that is all that your piano.eu stores. More importantly is what we don't store, and that is mostly the actual content of the objects itself, the images, the video, the audio, uh, the 3D models, all of the things that you would say, this is a digital cultural heritage object, is not stored with us. It is stored at, on the servers of the institutions themselves, so of the museums, the galleries, libraries themselves. Um, going back to the banana example, um, we store a thumbnail of this image, but that image itself is actually stored on a different server. And so if we would go back to the... Um, metadata file of that, which I think is this one, yes. Um, if we go look at the uh, Europeana aggregation, yes. You will see a uh, field here that is called EDM preview, which means this is where the thumbnail is found. It's a preview of the actual image. And you'll see that that thumbnail is, of course, a URL of an image, and that URL is api.europeana.eu. So that is our website. This is where you'll find our thumbnail. And if you click that, wow, it's a thumbnail of a banana. The actual or original image itself uh, or the original object will always be found in EDM is shown by. Why these fields were called the way they are, um, I'm sorry, I'm not able to tell you. See that some people are squinting at the screen, so I'm going to make it a little bit bigger for people to see. Um, EDM is shown by um, is the field that stores the actual object. And you'll see here that that image isn't a europeano.eu URL, but it's griffiths.askaboutireland.ie URL. So this is the server of the Cultural Heritage Institution itself. This is important because if you're creating a, a project, writing some code, creating your own website, this means that if you want to get all these objects, you'll connect to your Piana's API, and through your Piana's API, you will get URLs that show you where to find the objects themselves. So if you just want to show people the main 
you know, full resolution image of this banana in this case, you'll need this URL, which, well, it's a picture of a big banana. So that is an important distinction to make that we link to different um, data providers and their servers independently. So that's something that Europeana doesn't store, but we do store all of that other metadata. How do we get that data? And now we get to the, the meat and potatoes of this webinar or these webinars, our API. What the hell does that mean? What is an API? That's what we're gonna get into in this last hour or so. You can describe an API in very difficult terms, but uh, the easiest way that I've found to describe it is, you know, here's an image of the huge Europeana infrastructure. Things are connecting to other things. Institutions are connecting to websites that are connecting to people. Um, what I want you to focus on is the little kind of USB connector dongles between all of this. These connectors between our platform and stories or our platform and tech or our platform and other websites, this is what the API exactly does. You can see it as a plug and play device where you can plug in your Piana's tools, your Piana's data into whatever else, you know, is a socket that, that can plug this uh, piece of electrical engineering in. And if you connect these two together, you'll be able to get a feed from all of our data into whatever you've connected it to. Um, and uh, you might be able to feed information back as well. This analogy is a good one because this connector is also a kind of universal connector. It's a USB-C connector. It is structured in a way that almost all APIs over the whole internet are structured as well, which means that if you learn to use a single API, and this is really good for students as well, if you learn to use a single REST API, you'll probably be able to use all other APIs or most other APIs, if not immediately, very quickly as well. So um, teaching about APIs doesn't have to start with your Piana's API. You can do any other API that you think is interesting. If you want people to use the Twitter API first because you know social media is interesting, um, or a Google API or Google Maps or whatever. Um, teaching them that will also teach them to use your Piano's API and vice versa. I would love it if you would start with your Piano API and then take that knowledge to um, teach people about other APIs. API stands for Application Programming Interface. You don't need to know that, but that's what it stands for. Um, this kind of universal connector that I talked about is called REST. REST is basically a standard for how APIs are developed. If you see that there is a, if you go to some documentation and it says this is Twitter's REST API or Twitter's RESTful API, that means that this API has been developed using the same universal connector, the same standard connector that most other APIs use as well. And of course, your Piano's API is also a REST API. What this actually means, how this is designed, um, we can get deeply into. I won't, but I will you know, give you the kind of main overview, meaning that an API that is RESTfully developed has a few standard ways of connecting to it. Um, those three main ways I've put here, there's more, but these are the three more important ones um, called GET, POST, and DELETE. A, a GET request is really what it says. You are getting data from this API. If you send a GET request to an API, you're saying, get me some information, get me images of all of the cats on your piano. And the your piano API will respond with those images. So you're getting information in, uh, that's what get means. Post is the opposite. It's like posting a letter, you're sending information through the API to your piano. 99% of what you'll do using an API are get requests because you want information, you want to consume that and reuse that in a different way. Um, in some cases, for instance, if you're doing a crowdsourcing campaign where you're letting people tag objects and so they're enriching that object, you want to send your piano that new information that you've just created. And you would do that using a post request. You're posting that information to us and the response you'll get from your piano's API is, thank you, we've, we've you know, taken this data in, it is now part of our database. Then the last one, delete, also speaks for itself. Um, this has, you cannot do this using your Piano's APIs. Luckily, you need, you need some specific um, passwords to do that, but that is another you know, basic idea of, if you say, I don't want this record to exist anymore, I will delete it. 
you will send a delete request to an API. Lastly, all APIs that are RESTful work over HTTP, meaning that they work in the same way that another website would work. That means that you can surf to our API and interact with our API the same way that you would surf to a website. So that is why I could show you this metadata file just in my browser. This is in Chrome. This isn't a specific program because this is an HTTP request. If you go up here, you'll see that it uses HTTP, HTTP secure, but this is what the API is. So it's not a, a really difficult thing that you need a specific piece of software for. You can just interact with APIs in your browser, be it Firefox, Chrome, Safari, whatever. Um, and that's great for something like a low code hackathon where you don't need to learn a new piece of software. You can just do things um, on uh, in your web browser. Great. REST APIs. As I said, most APIs are developed RESTfully. Um, there are a bunch of APIs out there. A lot of institutions want to connect their information in some ways to other institutions. That's how Europeana gets their data in mostly as well. We don't, most of the data that, that we get into Europeana hasn't been sent to us on a USB stick or in a CSV file. It has been sent to us through an API, which means that the original institution, the original museum or gallery or library needs to have an API as well. Um, there's hundreds of cultural heritage APIs out there. Um, the main website that I always refer to, if you're interested in finding APIs that are relevant, interesting, um, collect or connected to cultural heritage is this website, I think. I it co correctly, it's, it's um, a kind of uh, list made by uh, Professor Mia Ridge, who is a um, very good digital hum humanities uh, researcher in the UK, where she's basically collected all of the uh, museum APIs that exist almost in the world. So whatever institution you're interested in, uh, be it the VNA in the UK, be it the Rijksmuseum in the Netherlands, um, any other institution, you can look it up on this website and see if they ha have an API or not. Um, I say this because I would prefer you use an API from an institution. If you only want data from that institution, then trying to use your Piana's API if you only want data from one institution anyway. We're great. Your Piano's API is great. I'm not saying that it that it's not, but it's easier if you want only data from one place to get it exactly closest to the source at the API of that museum itself. So if you're working on your project, if you have an idea that incorporates data from a single museum or maybe two or three, go to this URL first and try and find if they have an API that maybe works better for your use case than using your Piano's API for everything. Uh, let's see, next slide, oops. So yeah, I was just going to go to this. So this is the, the website itself. Um, it's a bit old school, but it, it's basically a huge list of um, interesting APIs. So this is uh, the catalog of Biblioteca Virtual Miguel de Cervantes, and then a, a Danish museum, the American Museum of Natural History. So literally anything that you can think of would be here. And of course, your piano is also um, available. So let's um, zoom in a little bit on your piano's API specifically. We are uh, developed restfully, but what exactly um, do we do within our APIs? First off, to go and explore our APIs, as I already said, the one thing you need to do is get an API key. Um, this is not because we want to make it more difficult for you to start using APIs, but it is needed for security reasons because we make everything open and accessible. Um, someone might be able to start sending us 2 million requests in one second and you know shut our servers down. So that's why we need an API key so that if that happens, we can tell those people, no, revoke their API key. So this is the, the basic layer of security that we provide. Um, Whenever you're trying to use another API that isn't your Piano's API, the first step is always to look at what their authentication looks like. And this will always be the first thing you'll see in the documentation of an API. How do you get into this API? How do you start using it? The authentication for your Piano is to provide this API key, which is a small string of letters and numbers that is um, specific to you. 
um, if you want to, uh, oh, so sorry, I was going to post this in chat. So that is the website with all the APIs that I was talking about. Um, if you want to mess around with the APIs before getting an API key, you can always use this key um, called API2 demo that will always work everywhere. Um, so getting this API key is important. And whenever you're looking at another uh, Glam API, think about the authentication there as well, because it might be more difficult than your Pianos API. You might have to request a key that someone personally will then have to approve. With us, it's automated. Whenever you, you fill in the form, you'll get a key, um, or you might have to log in with a certain uh, with a certain account, or you might um, have to you know authenticate in another way. So your Pianos API is by getting a key. When I'm talking about your Pianos API, um, I'm actually lying. We have a bunch of APIs. Uh, we have, I think, about nine different APIs right now, which might seem daunting at first, but we separate these these APIs um, out because they have different um, use cases and different needs. So the second step you need to do after thinking about authentication is thinking, what is the use case for this API? What do I want to get from your Piana? And um, let's just go through the different APIs that we have so that I can explain to you what they do. Um, the two most important APIs are um, our search API and our record API. So this first field is just general information about how we developed our RESTful APIs. These are the first two real APIs, the search API and record API. Um, they do exactly what they say on the tit. The search API is the API that takes care of whatever you do when you're searching on your piano.eu. Whenever you type something into the search bar and hit enter, you'll send a GET request to the search API, and the search API will return with a response um, that has a few objects in it. Then if you click on a single object, a um, single record, or another GET request will be made, this time to another API, the record API, that will give you all of the information about one single record. And we can see this happen live on your Piana if you uh, search. Um, what I'll be doing now if you want to uh, replicate this is um, at the bottom of your Piana.eu, there is a thing called for developers. Um, if you click this, uh, you will learn how to enable developer info, which will make it possible for you or whoever you're working on with your project to see what is happening in the back end of europeano.eu, what API requests we are making. And this is a really good way to learn how our APIs work or how an API works in general, um, because you'll see how we have done things. How do you enable, uh, enable developer info? You'll go to this. A web page called europeano.eu slash debug. And what you'll see there is a very simple interface. This with one toggle, enable or disable. So if you click enable here and it's blue, then you can put in an API key. This can be the API key you just requested or the demo key, API2 demo, and you hit save. Once you've done that, you'll get back uh, to europeano.eu but now you'll be able to see the secret sauce of how your piano is made in the background. So if you now make any search, so let's search for dogs and hit search, what has actually happened in the background here? We can find that out by again, scrolling to the bottom. And now this is something you'll see that wasn't there before called API requests. If you click this, you'll see exactly what has happened in the background. So as we learned, a GET request means that we want to get some information from the Europeana API. So what it has done was it has a, sent a GET request to Europeana, uh, Europeana's API, the search API, with um, this uh, API key and with the query dogs. So it has queried the API for dogs. I'm going to make this a bit bigger as well. It has sent a GET request to api.europeana.eu. It has sent this using the search API and the query it had sent is dogs. If we click on this uh, request, it will actually make the request again, but then only in the API without the nice, you know, interface that, that your Piana has. Let's make this normal size again. Um, 
This is a nice interface. This is what is happening in the background. Again, we'll see some scary data, but if we you know, look at it more in depth, it makes a lot of sense. Um, this API information that we didn't have to look at. And then it has items count 24. It says, here are the first 24 items that the API has, re has returned. If you go back here, you'll see that this first page will have 24 items on it. The total results though, is 6,303. So it has found in the search API 6,303 items that are related to dogs in some way. And if you go back to our nice view, you'll see that the total results here is 6,303 because it got that from the API. And then we'll see items and then a bunch of information. Again, instead of going through all of this, let's just close this up and we'll see that there's 24 items in items because there's 24 separate objects that it has returned. And so if I close all of this, we'll see that there's 24 um, of these. I'm not going to do all of that. So if you just look at the first one, um, for every object in our search request, a little bit of information will be returned. Not the whole object, but some information that is important in describing this object on a search results page, like the description the provider, um, the title, underbind dinner, docs at dinner, um, the preview, the thumbnail. So this basic information is all that this web page needs to show you what the search results are. It has a title, it has the provider, it has a preview, it has a description because if you change to this view, there's a description. So the search API is great if you want to send a request and get all of the possible results for that request. If you want to get all of the dogs on your Piana, you will use the search API. But be aware that if you use a search API, not all of the information about every object will be returned. Only a, sub a subset of that information will be returned because we're using it to show you search results. This might be all that you need. Maybe you just want to create a cool online gallery that uses a bunch of images that you can use these thumbnails for. So the search API might fit exactly what your need is. If, however, you want um, to get all of the information about a single object, which is what you would do if you would click on one object, this is what a separate API is used for, and that is the record API. So if you go back to our secret passage here and click API requests, we'll see that a bunch of requests are made. We're always going to look at the first one. It has again made a get request. Let's make this a bit bigger again. It has again made a get request um, to our API, this time to the record API. And its request has basically been this, a number and then an identifier. It has requested from the record API a data set and then a single item in that data set. So this number is the data set ID, and this um, string is the uh, unique identifier for this object. If we click on this again, we'll go to what this looks like in the API, um, and we'll see, like we did with the banana, an object, which has a bunch of information on it, and then all the information about this single object. Um, so, that is to show you the, the clear distinction between, between search API, which gives you a bunch of objects as return, um, but not all of the information, and the record API, which gives you all of the information about a single object. The main question that might arise is, you know, especially in research, a lot of what people want is all of the objects about something, but also all of the information about that object. What if I want a hundred images of dogs, but I want all of the data and metadata about all of those objects. Well, that means you'll have to send a GET request to the record API 100 times, once for every object you want to look for. And this seems like, whoa, this seems like a lot of work. This is really, you know, this takes a lot of time. Um, but APIs are made to handle a bunch of requests at one time. So it's totally ordinary to send hundreds, even thousands of requests to a record API if you want a full data set with all of the information um, about every object. 
So another thing you shouldn't be scared about is sending a bunch of requests. And this can be done through code, through low code as well, without you having to manually type a thousand requests to an API. Great. So that's the difference between the search API and the record API. I won't go into detail about all of the other APIs. Just know that they exist. Um, we use them for different things. Um, when I was talking about that, sometimes you want to post information to your Piana. If you're, for instance, doing a crowdsourcing event, that is what the annotations API is for, because you're annotating an object with some extra information, and then you would post that to the annotations API. You might have heard about IIIF, which is an interoperable way of showing images on the web. We have a trip, we have a IIIF API as well, because you need to have a separate API if you want to show IIIF. And then we have a bunch of other APIs, like a Sparkle API, which is used for Wikidata. Um, and lastly, and this is maybe interesting, especially for a low-code event, this harvesting and downloads page is not an API, but is a different shows different ways of getting our data without having to interact with an API, without having to code. This was specifically made for researchers who wanted to just download one data set without having to, you know, start coding APIs and, and get, you know, these thousands of requests to the record API. They just wanted a data set completely the way that a museum or a library had created it. And on this page, we show how you can do that um, very easily. So one way you can do that is by using an FTP server, um, which is a really uh, easy way of kind of connecting to the file server of your Piana and just downloading a full data set like you would download, um, you know, something off, off of WeTransfer or something like that. Um, and then we also have an OAIPMH API, which is a bit more involved, so I won't go into that further. Right, okay, I know I've been uh, going into the weeds a bit, so I'll pause for a second while I find my bearings again. We've made a few API requests already today. Um, we've uh, seen how you can look at search requests in the background of your piano.eu. We've made a few records, record requests to that dog item and to the banana item. Um, these requests were all kind of pre-built for us because we clicked on them and they were already made. But the main way where you're, when you're developing your own program, your own app, your own uh, working in your own project, you'll have to build your own API queries that have a bunch of different um, fields in them and a bunch of different ways to kind of filter down your your query. So a way to build your API is what is uh, called the API console, which is a kind of easier, more form-like way of uh, creating an API request. So I'm going to go to that now. That's this page. Um, and it's kind of a way to play around with the API, see what the different fields do, and um, try and make some requests of your own. So our API console gives access to two APIs right now, the search and the record API. Um, and you'll see that here, search and record. Let's just go to the search API for now. And again, you'll see these methods that we talked about. There's two or three get methods and one post method. Um, we're going to use the most simple uh, search that we can do on the right. Um, there's an explanation of what every method does. So search for records is the easiest thing you could do. We're just going to search in your Piano's database using our API. So if I open this, another maybe on first glance scary thing will open, which is a kind of advanced search form with a bunch of fields, and then at the end, try it out. You don't need to know what every field does. I don't know what every field does. I have no idea what q.source is, for instance. Um, the way to start with this is to know that there are two fields that are mandatory in every um, search uh, query, and that is your query itself. You'll see here that it's required, and WS key, which is your API key, which is also required. So in our WS key, let's put API2 demo for now, and then in the query, we can query whatever we want. So just like before on europeana.eu, let's query for dogs, and then you'll click try it out. This result that we see here is exactly the same API call as the one that you saw on europeana.eu. Um, it returns some items, 
it returns more items here because your piano hides some items um, and it kind of shows you the results of all of those items. This is a, um, a way to then filter down your search a bit more um, based on exactly what you want to look for. So for instance, if you only want to uh, look for things that, uh, let's say, uh, that you that are that have an open copyright license that uh, you can for sure reuse. So that forty seven percent that I talked about that is either CC by or public domain. In the reusability field, you can then put open, which means that the reusability will always be open. If we make this call again, we'll get some results, but you'll see that the total results are a lot lower this time. We have one thousand six hundred results instead of the 7,000 of before, because it has filtered down to only show you open results. How the heck do I know that I need to write open in this reusability field to make it work? You know, if you write something else like openly licensed, it won't work because that's not how the API works exactly. Again, you'll get the 7,000 items, so it hasn't worked. The way to, to, to find out how to use these fields is to go to the documentation pages, which is another maybe scary thing at first, but um, is very self-explanatory. So if we go to the search API page here that I was hovering over before, you'll get a really long, big document that is the full documentation of uh, your Piana's search API. Um, it gives you an, uh, 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 information about every single field that you can use in the Europeana API um, and exactly what that field accepts and what that does to your data. So what we just did was in the reusability field, the field is also called a parameter, um, it accepts a certain data type. So a string means it accepts text. A Boolean means it accepts either true or false. Um, in, this, in the string data type, it will, uh, give three possible values, open, restricted, or permission. So that's how I know that those three words work in the API in the reusability parameter. And that's how you should approach this console or whenever you're making an API call as well. You first try and find out what is it exactly that I want to do. Um, this can be done easily by making your search on your Piana first. So um, let's make this smaller. Um, on your piano, let's search for dogs again. And then the question is, how do we want to filter down these 6,000 results? Maybe we only want images. On your piano, you would do that by going to the filters on the right and select type of media image, the same way that you would filter down on uh, Amazon or another website. And most people know very easily how to do this. Um, these filters are exactly one-to-one -one replicated on our API. So if you would only want images um, in your search on the API, what you would do is you would go to our documentation and you would search for um, the thing that you want to find. So if I only want images, what I would do if I'm in a documentation page is I would control F and just in the page search for the word image and then go through until I find the actual field that I want. There's a bunch of fields that are relevant to images. So you can, for instance, search for a certain image size, image color, if it's grayscale or not, what the aspect ratio is. Um, you can go through all of that until you find exactly what you're looking for, um, which is the type, um, which I know because I've been using the API for a long time, but you would as well if you're going through this yourself. Um, and the type itself would then be here. So type, you can choose to be image. And you'll see that as well on your Piana. If you're looking at the actual URL in the search bar, it will also say type is image. So to recreate this search on our API, we would go back to our console and um, to check this certain type of something in the query facet, we would type type um, should be image. No, not all match. Image. Now, 
hope that works. Let's see. This is still open. Let's not change that usability. Let's try that out. And again, we have a smaller number of items than we had before. So it works. Um, all of that we have returned now is images. And this kind of method of finding out what you want to do, finding the right parameter in the documentation for what that actually means, and then filling that in in something like a console or in your browser um, is the way that you would build an API call up. Um, another way to find that out instead of going to the documentation is, as said, to look how your Piana itself does it. Um, if you go to, so we have now made this request and, and asked for only images. If we would go back to these API requests here, we could see in the get in the first one that we wanted to get again. Um, and this is the actual uh, query itself. The query is dogs um, and the type should be somewhere as well. Okay, I see that they've that they've broken it up here because it's the content here. But so in the URL itself, you would also see type is image. Um, this works exactly the same in 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 other APIs um, too. So it's not uh, specific to your piano. Great. Once you've kind of figured all of this out, another good way to try and think about use cases for how you want to use this API is to look at what other, what others have done. We are an open data platform. You can recreate your piano.eu. You can recreate that image picker that I showed you. Um, looking at these different in, uh, interpretations and maybe going to the, the source code of what is being done there, like the, the GitHub page of, uh, of these integrations can also teach you how these other projects have um, worked on uh, using your Piano's API. And at the webinar tomorrow, I will go a bit more in depth on showing you some examples under the hood of how other people have used our APIs for an integration. So uh, what I mostly want to, you know, get you at is to uh, get you inspired to try these things out on your own, because that's how you learn how to use an API and how students learn how to use APIs as well. So going to the For Developers page and enabling the debug, which I showed you so you can then see um, the API calls for yourself is a good first step. And uh, finding out how our API calls are made um, is the way to go forward. I could go into the next part already, but maybe this is good enough for today. Um, I'm aware that we have half an hour left, but maybe you are all brimming with questions, things you want to know about. Uh, so I'd love to open the floor to all of you and see if uh, there's things that you were unclear about or things you had questions about. Uh, feel free to speak up or put something in chat. If they don't have, I, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. Yeah, um, all the APIs uh, in the world are open or some are private. Everybody can access to Twitter, Netflix, Spotify APIs and play with it. Uh, no, yes and no. So um, if if an API is described online, like the, the Twitter API or the Spotify API, that means that you can get to it in some way. So uh, the different companies will describe their APIs in different ways or give access to them in different ways. Um, for instance, the Twitter API will only give you information from, I think, the past few days on Twitter. So it gates some information behind locked doors. And if you want, as I said, to send thousands of requests to the Twitter API, it will say, okay, you are limited to maybe 200 requests. And if you want to get any more, you'll have to you know, pay some money or get a, get a, a premium account to use that API. So some APIs have, have paywalls, some don't. Okay, I see Hannah and Bram. So let's start with Hannah. Uh, hi, thank you for such an interesting presentation. And uh, I have a question. Uh, if we are going to work in a team with colleagues and with students, how do we collaborate uh, on API? How does this collaboration happen? So can, uh, different people uh, located in different uh, 
places or access it from their own devices and still collaborate somehow? Yes. So the Europeana's APIs work um, over HTTP, as I said, which means that if you, for instance, uh, Hannah, would create an API call and you want other people to collaborate with you to work on it, you could send them literally the link itself. And it's like sending a link to someone else. So this API call can be a work in progress and you can say, okay, I'm sending you this link via email or Slack or whatever. Um, and then other people can access it exactly the same way that you have and um, add things onto it, uh, delete and edit. So it is something completely open that won't be different on your uh, computer or, or your platform than someone else. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, and just to, because it's related with Hannah question, mm -hmm. uh, do they need all the team members get an uh, API key or with one and they can share it uh, will be, is there any problem here? That's a good question. Um, using one key, for a whole team uh, or for a whole group is totally fine. So you don't need to get your personal API key. Um, it's also, you know, a bit tiring to, if you get a call from someone else that you want to work on, that you have to delete their key and put in your key. Um, so it's it's fine if if one of the team gets a key and then shares it with everyone. Also for something like like this hackathon, um, it's totally fine to use the the API to demo key during your work. And once you have want to, only when you really want to put this in an official kind of project or program and you're publishing this on the web, then you would need to have one key for that specific project. Um, but that's something you can work out, you know, once your project is finished. Thank you, Yolan. Bram, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah, so the question. So first, a very interesting uh, presentation. API looks very comprehensive, <laughs> very nice. And um, so say that we're going with a crowdsourcing uh, budget and. Uh, I'm in, uh, say, a museum or a church, and I see an object. Um, and uh, um, in our case, I have a computer vision algorithm which detects which object it is. And uh, I want to, for example, send annotations to the API, post it, or uh, send images. Can I just post it using the API? Or would I, for example, send a push request or um, just yeah. post? Uh, great uh, question as well. The answer is that yes, you would send a post request. You would need a, a bit different authentication parameters for that post request because you cannot just post with a simple API key since you're adding things to our database. Um, but if that is something that you want to do, we can you know get you those authentication keys. Um, you would have to. It would have. It would become an authentication header. Um, and since you're doing with with you know vision, I assume that that you know um, putting something in the authentication header of your API request. Um, is something you would be able to do, and then that uh, would be able to be, you know, ingested by our by our annotations API without an issue. So I would um, advise you to go look at our annotations API documentation. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. That, that's what I wanted to know. Thank you. Great, thank you, Bram. Um, also, so awesome. tomorrow. Um, at the webinar tomorrow, I would like to either start or end with basically everyone here, if you're comfortable to kind of talk about the projects you have in mind or the team you have, what you're thinking about, so that together we can start working out exactly the kind of nitty gritty little tech things of what you would need to do, what the first steps are, so have you completely prepared for the actual kind of low code fest event in November. Um, hopefully that can then set set you on your way uh, with a little bit of more knowledge of how do I start this this uh, this crazy idea and how do I put it into uh, actual use, so I'm looking forward to that tomorrow. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Go ahead. One more question. Um, so, uh, say that I want to uh, classify uh, information in the database. Is there a, like a time uh, when it was created? That time of submission, time of creation, is that in there, or maybe sort of like a um, uh, period or uh, style style it belongs to say or Coco Baroque. I I don't know. Is that also in the database or yes? Um, okay, I... so uh, you're talking about a few different things. So first off, there is a a timestamp a timestamp created field and a timestamp updated field for the um, for the metadata file itself. So when you are updating something with new metadata and then posting it to our annotations, you would have to um, 
put something in the timestamp updated field saying, hey, I added some information to this on you know October 2022. Um, when you're doing style um, recognition, for instance, if you want to say, uh, say that something is, is Rokoko, there, is, uh, there are specific fields that um, are described in, in your Piana data model where you would put that this is a certain artistic style of the object. Um, what that is exactly, I don't know off the top of my head, but the documentation will be able to tell you that. Okay, great. Yeah, so very useful. Good. Um, well, one thing I, I want to... Uh, put in your head, especially because you're looking at uh, visual recognition, is that the biggest challenge currently for this kind of data is creating and or finding the training data to do this. Um, using, you know, uh, conventional uh, visual recognition models doesn't work very well on cultural heritage data, mostly because it's old data that is probably low resolution or it, um, you know, isn't photographed very well or very consistently. So, if you want to do things like style recognition, the first step would be to find a good training data set that you could um, train your algorithm with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was thinking of maybe sending in a uh, hundred students or something into the museum and let them all make five pictures to uh, make it and uh, use the crowdsourcing option you mentioned to generate the test. I'd love that. Data. Yeah, go for it for sure. Okay, cool. Thanks. Thank you. Great. If that's all the questions for today, then I think we can uh, quit while we're ahead and give everyone 15 minutes of uh, free time back. Yeah, I think it's uh, quite a lot of uh, information to process. I see different levels of, under, uh, of understanding of this API technology. And I assume that for some will be a bit more challenging. They will need more time to watch the video again, try it out with the, with the different um, uh, platforms and, and documents that you showed us. Well, same platform, but some different ways to access the information. Um, uh, let's meet tomorrow, uh, again, the same time, 4.30 for all of us. Uh, and after the masterclass of Yolan, we'll <laughs> meet Alteo that uh, will uh, explain us the next steps, uh, uh, what's going to happen on the 10th and 11th November when you will meet again uh, people that will help us, will help you to, to shape your projects. So have a nice evening. Thank you very much for uh, being so adventurous and adventurous to join us in this, uh, in this um, new event. And um, see you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you all. For the people that can't be there tomorrow, it will also be uh, recorded. So you'll be able to watch it after the fact. Thanks everyone for being here and see you tomorrow, same time, same place. Thank you. Okay, see you tomorrow. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye, -bye.